Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm uh, Fergal McNamara, and I'm the co-chair of the Climate and Energy Group here at the IIEA. And I'm delighted this afternoon to welcome uh, Dr. Timur Gul, Chief uh, Technology Officer of the IEA, which is the International Energy Agency, uh, an organization well known to many of us here. Uh, they're a policy advisor to their member governments, including Ireland, and our own uh, Minister Eamon Ryan is a co-chair of the agency. And they produce uh, flagship reports to our energy outlook and the energy technology perspectives every two year cycle and periodic peer reviews, much appreciated of Irish energy policy. And over the years, we've had several speakers from the agency here, including uh, Dr. Birol, uh, Claude Mandel, I can remember back uh, when he came to us. And last year, uh, Laura, Laura Cossey came. Uh, in his address this afternoon, uh, Timor will discuss uh, the role of the energy uh, um, energy technologies and innovation in the energy transition. And he will speak for uh, 20 minutes or so, uh, followed by a little discussion with me and Q&A that uh, I hope that you will put in by using the Q&A function in Zoom. And let us know, please, who, who you are and who you're affiliated with and uh, put them in as soon as they occur to you. Don't, 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 please don't wait till the end of the call and I'll do my best to get to them and uh, put them uh, to Timor. If you um, use Twitter or X, please use the handle at IIEA. And with that, it's my great uh, pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Timor Gould, who's uh, Chief uh, Technology Officer of the IEA, has responsibility for analyzing innovative and emerging uh, new technologies in the energy transition. Uh, Timor has uh, been with the IEA since 2009 and was formerly um, was formerly a lead author of the World Energy Outlook, uh, a German national, and uh, before the IEA worked at the as a researcher at the Paul Scheer Institute in Switzerland. And so with that, Timur, uh, very welcome to the IIEA, and we're delighted to um, hear your address. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Fergal, and uh, real, really great pleasure to be here with you um, today. Um, uh, it's the first time I uh, have the opportunity, but um, I know, as uh, uh, as you just said, that um, several of my colleagues um, uh, IEA senior management have been addressing um, this audience in the past, so really delighted to um, be here with you um, today. My role here is, at the IEA is mostly to look at um, everything that deals with new and emerging clean energy technologies, which is, of course, an area that is uh, currently front and center with um, many um, uh, governments around the world. We are advising our member governments, but also many other governments around the world, um, as well as stakeholders from all parts of um, the energy system, be it the industry, be it uh, finance sector, be it the research community, be it um, uh, civil society, whoever it is, everyone. Uh, energy is something that uh, concerns all of us, um, both in terms of um, our daily uses of energy, but also, of course, the impacts that um, energy has on uh, climate, uh, air pollution, and many, many other um, fields. So really uh, delighted to be here with you today. The intention of my talk Taking it a bit um, from my um, role as uh, Chief Energy Technology Officer here today is to look at um, the clean energy transition um, through the lens of um, technology. I will um, draw on um, some of our um, recent work here, which is um, in particular our recently released uh, Net Zero by 2050 roadmap update. Um, we launched that in September, but also looking into some of the kind of related aspects on uh, clean energy technology supply chains um, uh, for uh, many of the uh, kind of key technologies that um, everyone is currently um, looking at. Um, one of the overarching themes, I guess, is um, of, of our work that we have been doing um, in this particular year um, is um, to think through the uh, transition to net zero by 2050. So what you would uh, roughly require to um, uh, meet the 1.5 degrees uh, temperature goal, um, and uh, the reason, what what the underlying reasons why we as the IEA think um, that um, despite the pathway to net zero by uh, 2050 narrowing, we believe that the strong development that we're seeing in uh, clean energy is actually leaving that uh, pathway still open. Um, I hope you can see my screen well, but um, what I um, 
would like to start with is the fact that there, uh, our news screens are too often filled with bad news. And I, I understand them. No, I mean, all of us, uh, I guess, have that um, uh, have a, set up a similar sentiment here. CO2 emissions are at a record high. The impacts of climate change are becoming ever more visible. Energy prices remain high and volatile. But there are also a lot of reasons to be optimistic. Uh, it is We should not stop by looking at the bigger picture only, but should also look at some of the underlying structural changes that are going um, on in the energy sector, in particular in the case of clean energy technologies, where we have seen incredible growth, quite frankly, over the last two years, ever since the IEA released for the first time its net zero by 2050 roadmap. Let me uh, give you uh, two key examples here. One is electric cars, of course. Um, the sales have increased massively since the Paris Agreement was uh, uh, brought uh, uh, adopted in 2015, with over 25 million electric cars being sold over this time, and around 60% of these um, sales um, took place just in the last two years. So the growth of electric car sales, as we're seeing it in uh, global markets by now, is actually on track with what you need um, to reach a net zero by um, 2050 pathway. Uh, last year, um, we had uh, roughly 15% of all sal sal car sales being electric. Just three years ago, it was um, uh, two and a half percent. For this year, we are expecting one in five cars being sold uh, in the world uh, markets being electric. So massive growth um, that took place here. Very similarly, of course, for um, solar PV, the global rate of installations has dramatically increased over the last few years with capacity additions last year almost four times higher than in 2015, the year of the um, Paris Agreement. Around one third of all solar panels ever installed were installed just over the last two years. Again, significant growth, again, on track with what you actually need to be achieving um, for reaching net zero by um, 2050. Of course, not all of the technologies are on track here. This is not um, a story that is universal across the energy sector. Wind is one example. Um, manufacturers of wind turbines have been really struggling to boost productions of key components uh, on, against the backdrop of um, supply chain disruptions, cost increases. CCS, for example, um, uh, technologies that has long been seen as very promising and in fact uh, is important for reaching net zero emissions, has so far really disappointed and underperformed compared to uh, expectations. And um, what I'm trying to say here is that this is a very complex landscape. Well, you should not um, look at CO2 emissions alone, not look at the negative news alone. There are a lot of nuances here, a lot of reason to be optimistic on the clean energy side, um, but also some reason um, to, uh, to be attentive. And um, from our perspective, as I said earlier, the pathway to 1.5 degrees has narrowed, but we do believe um, clean energy growth is keeping it um, open. Now, an important part of a policy consideration, and also as we are going into um, COP28, um, is that um, we already have many of the tools that we need uh, in uh, energy markets today. Uh, we identified four um, uh, key areas that are actually particularly important to bend the emission curves um, to sharply downwards um, to 2030. They are all uh, well understood. They are all cost effective and they're all being uh, already deployed at an accelerating scale. These are, as you see here, um, scaling up renewable deployment. Um, these are um, improving the energy intensity improvements um, through electrification, as well as through increasing energy efficiency and uh, cutting methane emission. Um, the um, objective in our net zero pathway, as we have it here, is for um, uh, annual sector greenhouse gas emission to fall by nearly 40% by um, 2030. And we do think, uh, from according to our analysis, that these actions that you can see here on the screen can deliver over 80% of the emission reductions that need to be achieved between now and um, 2030. If you look at somewhat closer on how this plays out, um, uh, these particular areas uh, play out. Then you need. Uh, then you see that uh, what you need first and foremost is a tripling of uh, renewable capacity additions, um, uh, renewable capacity by the year 2030 to reach um, 11,000 gigawatt in total. 
this is the single largest driver of emission reductions um, for this for this decade to 2030. And so we are encouraged to see the strong momentum that this message that we put forward um, already early in the year, but um, now with the update of the net zero by 2050 roadmap, once again, um, that this is resonating in um, the global uh, climate discussions, uh, solar PV, um, uh, and uh, wind are uh, widely deployed, um, rapidly deployable. They're also in most cases the cheapest new source of electricity in many markets today. Um, we actually uh, see that current policy settings already put advanced economies and China on track to achieve 85% of their contribution that they need to make to for this particular global um, goal. But in other countries, uh, much more support uh, will be needed. The cost of capital for renewables in emerging markets and developing economies is more than double um, in advanced economies and so stronger policies and international support will be needed here. Uh, of course, global renewable capacity needs to triple to be on track for our net zero by 2050 pathway, but there are also with a changing policy landscape, new opportunities coming up for um, nuclear energy with more than 30 countries accepting nuclear power today and increasing they use in a pathway that is compatible with um, net zero by 2050. The second um, uh, pillar that we've highlighted is uh, uh, doubling the rate of energy intensity improvement. It's the second largest source of emission reductions that you can have to um, 2030, certainly in our pathway. Um, there are three key levers here at the global level. Each lever has roughly the same importance but each country will have different approaches here. We are not all the same uh, as a country in terms of our energy sectors, et cetera. We all have different starting points, um, different economic um, uh, uh, power to it, et cetera. Some countries will uh, focus more on switching to more efficient fuels. Um, in advanced economies, electrification here is of course uh, particularly important. In developing uh, countries, you can get huge energy savings from universal access to uh, clean cooking. Some countries will lean more on improving the technical efficiency of end use technologies. Um, some countries may choose to promote awareness and incentives that foster behavioral changes. So there are many components that can help um, double the energy intensity improvements moving forward. The third element is um, uh, a dramatic cut in methane emissions from fossil fuel operations, 75% is what we think is actually uh, possible, achievable, mainly through rapid and concerted efforts to lower methane intensity across the fossil fuel industry, including through measures that help reduce flaring, venting, and um, uh, stopping, leaks, uh, uh, stopping leaks. Producer economies are, of course, crucial in this regard here. Um, Canada has already set a national goal of reducing fossil fuel methane by 75%. Um, uh, other countries are following suit. There is a, um, a global methane pledge um, uh, in the, in, uh, uh, under the uh, COP um, taking place. So there are many, many efforts that are being taken. But the key point here is that um, this is uh, cost effective. This is rapidly doable. Um, there is no new technology that you need to invent. What you need to deal with is um, practices in oil and gas field operations, you need to deal with leaks in the pipelines, et cetera. This is not rocket science. It is technology that uh, exists and operations that need to be um, improved. Now, what you need to achieve, um, I, I hinted that already through the case of um, renewables, but, what you, um, but it's true more broadly, what you need to achieve in a net zero by 2050 pathway is, um, uh, strong growth in uh, clean energy technologies uh, deployment and clean energy uh, growth, growth doesn't come for free. Uh, it needs a big push in investment. Um, uh, uh, this year, the world is set to uh, invest roughly $1.8 trillion in clean energy. This needs to come to climb to $4.5 trillion by the year 2030, a two and a half times roughly increase over today's uh, level, uh, the sharpest jump you need to achieve here is in clean energy investment in emerging markets and developing economies outside China, where this is not a, a two and a half times increase, but it's a sevenfold increase to 2030 that um, we need to achieve in the net zero by 2050 pathway. It will require stronger domestic policies together with enhanced and more effective international collaboration um, uh, in, uh, around 80 to 100 billion dollars in annual concessional findings um, uh, and uh, so on. So a big push in clean energy investment is what is required 
to uh, achieve all those structural changes that we need to achieve in this present uh, decade. Um, the impact of this is, of course, a strong growth in, um, uh, uh, in uh, clean energy uh, technology deployment. You need a um, significant turnaround in the way we consume and we produce um, energy. Um, uh, the key part here is that scaling up the clean is not the only thing you need to achieve. You also need to bring down the dirty, which is uh, fossil fuels. So you need well-designed policy measures, uh, including the early retirement or repurposing of coal-fired power plants, the removal of fossil fuel subsidies um, uh, in order to um, help the scaling up of uh, clean energy technologies, that it leads to a decline in fossil fuel demand and not only to increase in uh, energy um, uh, use. Total fossil fuel demand in our scenario drops by more than one quarter by 2030 and more than 80% by the year uh, 2030. And that confirms our analysis that uh, no new fossil fuel investment is actually needed in this particular um, pathway. Now, a key point of the analysis is actually um, or a key narrative and a key insight that we've been developing over the course of this year is um, that the clean energy transition is in increasingly only uh, not only a question of climate change anymore. It's also not only a question of energy security anymore, where, of course, the moment you don't uh, use uh, fossil energy, but use uh, clean energy, domestically sourced uh, energy in particular, um, you uh, enhance your energy um, security. But above and beyond that, um, there is now an industrial opportunity um, that uh, is uh, shaping um, up. Um, we do believe that a lot of reason for hope for the clean energy transition is not only coming from policy, it is also coming from the clean energy, uh, clean energy industry. Clean technology manufacturing today is an immense industrial opportunity that not only the industries, but also countries are increasingly um, uh, recognizing, taking advantage of. Uh, we already have a uh, huge capacity to manufacture key technologies in operation today for solar PV and wind. Their output is equivalent to roughly one third of the production we need by 2030 in our net zero by 2050 pathway for heat pumps is around uh, one quarter. Solar PV manufacturing capacity in particular is not fully utilized. Um, we, manufacturers are currently operating on average well below uh, those levels that could be considered as typical industrial operations, which is around 85%. This is because investment were made in anticipation of higher demand. Uh, if operated at a typical level, then today's capacity would already be sufficient to supply two thirds of the solar PV deployment that is needed in 2030 to be on track uh, with net zero by uh, 2050. And there's um, more to come, of course, many countries are putting in place um, supporting policies in uh, that regards. Um, we are collecting industry announcements from around the world. And if we assume that um, all um, manufacturing projects that have been announced around the world proceed on time and in full, then global manufacturing capacities for solar PV and electric um, vehicle batteries would essentially be sufficient already um, uh, by 2030 to meet the demand that we are seeing in a, 20, in a net zero by 2050 pathway, even in this updated scenario that we produced in September, where we're actually putting a higher burden on these very promising, very fast growing um, type of um, technologies. This is significant because solar PV and electric cars alone provide around one third of the emission reductions that you need to achieve by 2030 in a net zero uh, by 2050 path pathway relative to today. Of course, not all of these projects will go ahead. Let's be also very clear about that. Many of them have not yet reached a final investment decision or started uh, construction and the announced manufacturing capacity for other technologies is still quite far from the levels needed by 2030. Wind industry supply chains in particular are struggling. I mentioned that earlier where the announced manufacturing projects fall for, for way short of what is required. It is really an area where policy support is needed, but we have seen in the past that manufacturing capacity can be ramped up very quickly. It takes roughly one to three years on average to build uh, new manufacturing capacity. So lead times are very, very uh, short here. 
Another reason why we do believe it, uh, there's a cause to be optimistic on the clean energy transition is coming from progress on innovation. When we released for the first time our net zero um, roadmap in 2021, um, we showed that almost half of the CO2 reductions in 2050 that are needed um, need to come from technologies that at the time of writing were not yet in the market at that time. This is not about technology miracles. Don't get me wrong on that one. Uh, it is just that some important technologies, such as certain battery types, uh, clean technologies and heavy industries, shipping, aviation, we're still at demonstration or um, prototype um, stage. What we do here at the IEA is we track the readiness of more than 550 clean energy technologies, which allows us to reflect closely on technology progress. The good news that is coming from that assessment is that in our updated pathway, looking at it fresh again this year, the share of emission reductions by 2050 coming from technologies under development today decreased from what was almost half two years ago to around 35%. There are two factors that underpin that first considerable progress that has been made on clean energy innovation, uh, including through the commercialization of uh, some key technologies. Think about sodium ion batteries, for example. And the second one is that the market for clean energy technologies is changing very quickly. And so, as I said earlier, we have updated our analysis with recent investment trends um, and announcements from technology manufacturers that um, basically um, gives rise to hope. Um, uh, on um, that front. But of course, there's much more uh, that is needed. Innovation is not uh, something that you need to stop at a certain moment because we have everything in the market. Um, first, we don't have everything in the market. Still, 35% uh, uh, of emission savings come from technologies that are not commercially viable um, today. And of course, innovation continues as you are entering the market to bring down the cost of um, these technologies. Nonetheless, very strong um, progress on the clean energy innovation space. Now, as I said earlier, clean energy technologies are no longer, it's deployment, it's manufacturing, et cetera. This is no longer just a question of climate, addressing climate change, energy security alone. It's also about um, the industrial opportunity that um, comes with it. And we've made in early, uh, early this year in the context of our energy technology perspectives, a detailed analysis of key elements of clean energy technology supply chains, where we found that these supply chains today are heavily geographically um, concentrated. The discussion there is, of course, uh, very frequently around um, mining, around concentration risks, and that's understandable. Um, the top three producer countries account, for example, for around 80% of global production in the case of cobalt, 90% um, for lithium, and around 45% for copper. But concentration is not limited to mining alone. As you move further downstream, you see a very similar pictures in other parts of supply chains. Uh, minerals must, of course, be processed and refined before they can become, can become materials that can be used. And um, there you see very similar levels of geographical concentration um, today. Um, bulk materials are very important, such as aluminum and steel. Uh, for clean energy technologies. Um, they are used to produce electric cars, wind turbines, etc. These materials are pr produced at scales that are orders of magnitude larger than for um, uh, uh, critical minerals in their mature market, but nonetheless, very significant level of geographical concentration there as well. But what's important here is that the manufacturing of the new and emerging clean energy technologies um, is also, in, in, in fact, almost more uh, concentrated geographically than other uh, steps. More than 80% of production capacity, uh, more than 70%, and in some cases up to 85% is held by the top three producer countries for batteries, for onshore wind, for solar PV, for heat pumps, uh, for uh, electrolyzers. If you look at the largest individual producer country, you see that China plays a dominant role virtually everywhere, with the one exception being the mining step where resource endowment is, of course, um, and the critical factor, not a policy effort, but for any other supply chain step, China is the largest producing country today and is likely to remain uh, that uh, for years to come for some of the key components of solar PV and battery supply chains. In particular, China today already has significant access capacity in place and operates at very low uh, utilization um, rates. As a final point, I would like to say a couple of words on um, the competitiveness of existing and new industries is a key concern for policymakers. It requires a careful look at the relative strengths for an effective participation in the new energy economy that is emerging. 
access to low cost energy is a traditionally a low uh, competitive advantage of course it can lead to lower production costs for energy and for commodities this is not something that is going to disappear with a clean energy economy if you take hydrogen as an example then virtually all of the hydrogen that is produced today is made from natural gas and coal typically at a cost of one to three dollars per uh, kilogram it's now increasingly produced at commercial scale using electrolyzers but tends to be more ex expensive there production costs here are set to plummet by 2030 from the falling cost of renewables electrolyzers and uh, hydrogen's uh, storage so that it could become competitive with conventional routes in areas with low cost renewable electricity even without a subsidy but just as oil and natural gas cost less to produce in some countries than in others there will be significant variations in hydrogen production cost mainly because of the underlying differences in the cost of renewable electricity um, this uh, you see here um, uh, or you see our detailed geospatial modeling shows that production cost could be significantly lower in countries like China, India, and the United States than in Japan and Western Europe. And um, the uh, knock-on effects uh, on the cost of industrial commodities is that it could be produced, that those commodities that could be produced using this hydrogen, such as primary steel, um, has, uh, 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 yeah, it has uh, knock-on effects down the road. In the medium term, of course, Europe and other high cost region that are at the innovation frontier will be able to maintain a competitive position if products in the market are differentiated according to their emission footprint. But in the longer term, more countries will be able um, to um, compete in the markets for such near zero emission commodities. And then cost, of course, will become a critical factor uh, again because commodities like steel are traded in fiercely competitive international uh, markets. With that, I'd like to um, leave it here and uh, very much look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much.